uh, money will dry up. So, as a result of these two changes, the monetary system, the world's monetary, not just one country, but, <coughs> but the world's monetary system, uh, completely changed its constitution. Previously, it was a, a symbol of anchor, and now it's more like a leather vein. As the tide of unpaid and unpayable debt grows, so ebbs the value of money. So not only that the uh, debt has to grow, we can actually put a number on it, a minimum number, which will show you at what rate it has to grow at the very least. It has to grow at least at the same rate as the rate of interest because all this debt we are talking about it has been contracted uh, at a rate of interest, a certain rate of interest. So interest is being paid and that's new money. This has to be created year in, year out. Because if it wasn't, then interest payments would come to a halt, and that would mean a collapsing of the <coughs> international monetary and payments system. So, Milton's clever horses, or C, I should say, uh, use, the, uh, use the nickname <laughs> horse, which we mentioned yesterday, the horse which is treading out the new cash to keep the world economy going, is facing an ever-increasing demand on his capacity because the amount of new money which has to be treaded out every year is increasing by at least the amount of interest which becomes payable. And that's at least because there is additional uh, increment as well. After all, we are we know that new debt is being contracted and uh, the old debt is not being retired. So I mentioned the year 1972, which was a milestone in the history of money and credit. And last year it was the 35th anniversary of that year when the brave new world of reckless that breeding started. If you look at any kind of chart, whether it's a chart of certain prices, or chart of indebtedness, chart of deficits, and so on, you will see a break. Year 1972, the charts have gone haywire. They started spinning out of control. And uh, that's all because the positive values which served as a foundation for the monetary system have been removed and replaced by negative values. This was poo-pooed, belittled by the economist, economist profession, but actually this is an extremely important thing and we have to pay due attention to it.
Now, 35 years is not a whole lot of time in terms of human history. It's just, but the interesting thing is that this 35 years was not long enough to move the authorities, academia, <coughs> the financial press, and other knowledgeable centers to, in, to ask the question, well, can we just stop for a moment and investigate how well this system has served the world, our nation, our people, society, this is completely ignored. The, in fact, the anniversary itself was ignored about 35 years, but uh, whether it's 25, 35, or 50 years, they are not interested. They just are so conceited in the righteousness of their ways that there is no critical evaluation is necessary. And certainly they are not interested in the opinion of people at large, in your opinion, in my opinion, or anybody else's who might just be critical about it. They just carry on and ignore the possibility that they might be leading the whole world economy into a disaster. So much so that actually uh, any discussion of these issues is off limits. I mean, if you want to do graduate work at any university and say, I would like to work on the problem of finding out whether uh, the monetary system, which is based on negative rather than positive values, is going to succeed in the long run, you won't be admitted. They don't, they don't want you as a graduate student. Forget about scholarships or any kind of other support which you might expect and other graduate students enjoy. If you are not a psychophant of the system, you have no place. The whole agenda of research and scholarship has been uh, controlled and stifled and no free discussion of the issues is allowed. It's accepted as a dogma that the gold standard is obsolete. Why is it obsolete? Because Keynes has said so. Milton Friedman has said so, and Milton Friedman got a Nobel Prize, so you should know, right? <laughs> and there's nothing to be discussed about it. That's the way it is. Take it or leave it. The progressive monetary system is what we have, which is based on that, and uh, Honorable gentlemen at central banks take good care that the world, the world economy is sailing smoothly and everybody is happy ever after. Well, we, we shall see just how happy people will be when the, that power reaches that threshold, that point where it's statical balance is giving way and the whole thing could collapse as a house of cards. But that's the way it is. Professional standing is reserved for those who pay lip service to the dogma that the emancipation from a metallic monetary standard was a progressive step an even necessary historical development. Back to Ludwig von Mises uh, uh, for another uh, little while. 
he published in the year 1912, which is just two years before World War I. At that time he was 31 years old. He published a monograph with the title English version. He published it in German and there were two editions in German before the thing was translated into English. But the English title is The Theory of Money and Credit. And the first American edition, which came out in 1952, he added a brand new, at that time, brand new chapter with the title Monetary Reconstruction. I mention this because Ron Paul, who is the presidential candidate representing the sound money movement. He uh, wrote an essay specifically on that appendix to Mises' work, which was written in 1952. Ron Paul uh, if you like, try, try to update it, because obviously in 1952 we were at the very, very beginning of a, a huge destructive development. Uh, we are nearing the end now, but at that time it was not clear in what form and shape this will affect the lives of people. Uh, by now we see more, so it needed a little updating, which uh, Ron Paul did, and I uh, call attention in one of my more recent, most recent internet publications, uh, which I gave the title. I don't know if you like it or not, but the title is Uncle Sam Crying Uncle. That's the title of my piece, and in this I mention that uh, Ron Paul uh, is a marvelous, marvelous uh, uh, can. It's a marvelous opportunity to have somebody in the year 2008 who takes on the whole establishment single-handedly and. Uh, Anybody just saw the article? Has okay. everybody seen that one? No. No. I have a copy. You have? Sure. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. If you want to see it, that's excellent. So, the, the, I, I uh, mentioned in my piece, which is on the internet, and I think I have it somewhere here, so I'll try to make it. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, this one. I thought you were talking about uh, Ron Paul's. Uh, no, your piece. That's yeah, my piece. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. I copy Yeah. Yeah. We 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 plan to do that. Uh, he uh, he's a great man. I have known him in person for some thirty years, and. Uh, I call him the minority of one in the U.S. Congress. Minority of one. Did you meet him in Washington? I, I, when, uh, yeah, I, I met him when, uh, when I was in Washington. He uh, uh, was already representative from Texas. I think uh, Lake uh, Jackson is his district in Texas. It's uh, uh, and I was working for another great man who is uh, who has retired in the meantime. I'm sorry to say, uh, I pity he did. William Dunnemeyer of California. I worked for him, and uh, uh, the two uh, congressmen were cooperating. And at that time. It wasn't a minority of one, because there were 10 Republican congressmen who 
were united in, on, on this issue. In fact, we prepared a memorandum for President Bush Sr., who was in the White House at that time in 1989. These 10 uh, Republican congressmen uh, went to the White House and presented a plan which I had the honor to work on for a number of years in, while I was in Washington. And, uh, they presented this plan, how to solve the problem, economic problem. Uh, and uh, the, the, the Mr. Dannemeyer was the leader of this delegation and uh, President Bush listened to it with interest, he expressed interest, and of course um, representatives from the Treasury and the Federal Reserve Board were also invited, and uh, Mr. Bush told uh, his uh, Secretary of the Treasury that the staff from the Treasury and the staff from Mr. Dunnemeyer's office should get together and iron out whatever wrinkles there might be so that the, uh, to see that a common plan could be produced. And uh, sure enough, a meeting for the staff members was scheduled on a certain date. And then two days before that meeting, the phone came from the Treasury that they have to reschedule it because something came fine, they rescheduled it. And again, uh, a day or two before the rescheduled meeting was supposed to take place, another phone call came that it had to be rescheduled again. And it went on three or four times, and then I realized that I was just uh, wasting my time. The Treasury never had any intention whatsoever sitting down together with us. How did the President Bush? Yeah, yeah, that's where he came from. Well, uh, but at least the President said that they should do that. He had to. He had to. That's his job. Well, either way, it's a very bad picture, I must say. Because if the Treasury can openly sabotage an order coming from the President and we outsiders are witnessing it, and the Treasury can defy the President because they do not call that meeting the President said. Well, that's bad enough too, you know, but I don't. Uh, I, I don't want to push this any further. I'm just stating the facts. This is what happened. So, uh, going back to Ludwig von Mises, uh, this uh, is an interesting uh, addition to his work on money and credit, this, um, which you find in the 1952 uh, edition of uh, Mises's work, because there are later development, in particular Ron Paul uh, commented on it and uh, made various suggestions. So Mises died in 1973, just one year after that big uh, milestone I'm talking about. He was 92 years old, and uh, he was a giant of monetary science. It's a great tragedy that our age, which should have benefited from his great wisdom, simply ignored him and marginalized him. That's the word, I think. Uh, Mises was not even given a chair at an American university. He came to the United States during World War II, I think the year of 1941, 
and uh, he was still very active then. And he lectured at New York University, but never as a tenured professor. He he was uh, uh, just hired to teach a few graduate courses and the salary was not paid out of university budget. His salary was paid out of a grant uh, which uh, a group of industrialists put together. So that's how he had an academic home. It didn't have it because he was recognized as a great scientist, he was barely tolerated. Now there were two between then, 1972 and now, there were two historical events which could have been a turning point. But Looking back, we have to say they were just missed opportunities. First was the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the second was the introduction of the euro, the uh, common money of the European uh, Union. The first event, the collapse of the Soviet Union, was I don't have to tell you, a, a, a most important and at the same time unexpected development. I think the CIA was just as much surprised by the collapse of the Soviet Union as, as the leaders of the world's communist movement themselves with all that money spent on intelligence gathering, they didn't have a clue what was actually happening. I was in Washington in the year 1989, and I mentioned this as an interesting little tidbit, that a high-powered delegation from the Federal Reserve was visiting the so visit and paying a visit in Moscow to to the highest uh, at the highest level the leader of that delegation was uh, Alan Greenspan himself and this was fully reported in the American press uh, that Alan Greenspan and his delegation made the suggestion, while well, it was known by then that the Soviet Union was having grave economic problems and monetary problems as well, and uh, Alan Greenspan suggested that a good way of solving these problems could be for the Soviet Union to issue gold bonds. That means to finance economic reform and development in terms of that which was, however, gold bonded. And there's a big difference because uh, at that time and since then, or actually all the way since uh, the 1930s, there have been no gold bonded debt issues. And that's not because there's no demand for gold bonds in the world. Well, you can imagine if there's demand for gold, then uh, there's even more so demand for gold bonds, which is, you know, in another word, gold bringing interest, paying interest in gold. 
there were no gold bonds around because they were banned. Not openly, but secretly. The U.S. Treasury, I assume, used arm-twisting uh, tactics in the uh, behind the scenes to apply to any country which might have issued gold bonds. Now for some reason this changed by the year 1989 and <coughs> obviously Alan Greenspan had the authority to make the suggestion. Did the Soviet Union wanted to issue gold bonds, it would not be resisted by the U.S. Treasury or the Federal Reserve. However, unfortunately for the Soviets, the <laughs> advice came too late. There, there was just no time to save the uh, Soviet Union, which collapsed not because of any political resistance, but there was, but there no hope uh, ever succeeding. The Soviet Union collapsed because of its inner economic contradictions. And the advice how to save it, in my opinion, was a sound advice, one of the few sound advice coming from Alan Greenspan. The Soviet Union could have been saved if the advice was given a little bit earlier. But it wasn't, and as it happened, the Soviet Union collapsed. But given the fact that the Soviet Union collapsed, which is uh, no cause for great mourning for most of us, I would say, certainly it was no cause for mourning uh, in uh, uh, in um, uh, the United States, uh, as recently as during the Reagan administration, so he was branded the evil empire, so okay, evil empire folded, uh, so much the better for the world. But that was a great opportunity to start uh, a new chapter, at least as far as those people who lived under the evil empire were concerned, and that included my country, Hungary, as well, because as you know, Hungary was an occupied uh, country uh, 50 years after uh, the World War, Hungary was still uh, occupied by Soviet troops. And those people were ready to cooperate with any kind of uh, uh, economic plan which the world had after World War II, but the people under Soviet occupation never benefited from that, and I think of uh, uh, Marshall Plan and other uh, economic cooperation between Western countries to rectify, uh, to heal the wounds of the war and uh, start a new development, which uh, of course Western Europe uh, so obviously benefited from. I must say that the wounds of World War II never healed, were never healed, were never given the opportunity of healing in, uh, in, uh, under the evil empire and satellite countries. So this was an opportunity. Unfortunately, the opportunity was missed. Those countries have undergone uh, changes, political, economic, and many others, but uh, there was no thought out plan, a coherent plan whereby the uh, 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 
these people could be integrated into the world economy. And I, I would say part of that problem was the monetary angle. That they, on the basis of the monetary system which we had, which we still have, this uh, ambitious plan could not be put into effect. So that was the first great opportunity which was missed. And we still suffer from it, I can tell you firsthand. I am not very optimistic about the position of my own country, Hungary, in, uh, in the world economy. It's, uh, it, uh, it's, uh, there are just too many problems, but that, uh, this is another topic which I don't want to get involved. The second missed opportunity was the adoption of the Euro, the new mon monetary unit by the European community. Now, if you think of the fact that the, uh, uh, what is usually referred to as the shutting of the gold window by Nixon in the year 1971, which is, in my opinion, a misrepresentation of what has happened, because what has happened was that Nixon simply defaulted on the gold bonded debt of the United States against uh, uh, other countries because according to several international agreements the United States dollar was the common currency of the world however it was to be payable or convertible into gold at the rate of thirty five dollars an ounce of gold and this was a solemn commitment of the United States to maintain the world's currency system on the basis of gold conver convertibility. And what Nixon did was simply uh, reneging on that promise. He defaulted on gold bonded obligation. Now, as a consequence, uh, Western European countries suffered greatly because you have to imagine that they were running their own household, they had the central banks, their treasuries and so on, and uh, uh, as long as the uh, US dollar was gold convertible at the fixed rate, they uh, could and, and they kept their own currency fixed against the dollar, they uh, had a, a reasonably functioning international monetary system. But once the uh, link to gold was cut, the US dollar started falling in value, the, in other words, uh, in the bursts, various uh, foreign exchange markets of the world, uh, uh, people questioned the uh, value of the U.S. dollar and started selling dollars and buying other currencies. So, uh, as a consequence, the dollar was falling against the French franc, German mark, British pound, and so on. Which meant that these countries incurred actual losses, and that was in 1971. So, when after a long time of hatching, they hatched out that euro, you might have expected that they learned from their lesson, that they burned their finger uh, 30 years earlier. So it's not a good idea to create an irredeemable currency out of nothing. 
So why not take this opportunity and go back to positive values rather than negative values? And uh, as you know, this is not what happened. The uh, European countries did not learn from their own earlier mistakes and they just embraced the same. They were greedy because what happened was that the U.S. could issue money for so many years, money which had currency all over the world, at 100 percent seniorage. They coveted this. They said, well, why, why don't we do the same? The Americans cut back a little, but we pick up what they have dropped. And again, there was no effort to discuss this at an academic level in a way that everybody, even critics, could have an input and <coughs> uh, see the uh, the, whether this plan was reasonable or uh, it could be criticized, this was just put through coercively, through the naked force of the government. And I think this was a very sad opportunity that was missed. Now, you might read in the papers today that the euro is going very strong, but that's of course nonsense. The euro is only strong in view of the weakness of the dollar. The fact is that both the euro and the US dollar are sinking and at one time one is losing value faster than the other but in absolute terms they are both losing value and that cannot last forever it will stop when they reach zero and that will be the end of the system so this is where we stand today with the two missed opportunities of the past 35 years. Now, all this is introduction, right? I have spent an hour to introduce my topic. <laughs> but I hope you learned more. <laughs> You just have to set the stage, right? And I think I have set the stage. <laughs> According to an old saying, a textbook on pathology makes you feel sick. In a healthy world, you are bombarded with pictures of worst case diseases. You have to look at the worst case scenario uh, under which a disease uh, is destroying the human body. Well, I may improve on this saying. I may say that a textbook on credit will make you even sicker. <laughs> Because in the real world, as it exists today, there are only pathological varieties of money and credit. There is no way to compare the pathology to the healthy state. And it wasn't always like that. Because in previous episodes, when uh, people experimented with irredeemable currency, with non-convertible currency, with currency based on debt as opposed to positive values. There was always, a, 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 there were countries around which did not compromise and they carried out their commitment 
to pay positive values on their debt. In other words, there were still gold standard countries around. But since 1971, this is no longer the case. The whole world is floating in rudderless ships on a stormy ocean and no anchor, no gold anchor or any kind of anchor which would give you a kind of uh, a measure of security. So a textbook on credit is a very sad reading because you are exposed to one pathology after another, another, another with no guiding principle around or no indication how you could go back to a healthy uh, organism. So in a sick world you are bombarded with pictures of uh, pathological forms of money and credit. Yet credit is one of the great blessings of society. It's a great creative force of civilization. And it's one of the supporting pillars of human welfare. Next to knowledge and capital, credit, these three things, knowledge, capital, and credit. They are the paramount engine of progress. It can hardly be doubted that the most of the prodigious amenities and inventions, technological, therapeutic, advances which are available to modern society, they all owe their origins to credit. You hear a lot of bad mouthing of pharmaceutical companies. Perhaps some of this criticism is justified, but I want to warn you that the pharmaceutical companies, whatever uh, you can hold against them, you have to give credit for doing the research. The enormous amount, laymen have no notion how much research has to go into uh, the preparation of a new uh, formula, a new medicine. And uh, this is far greater than any government ever supported medical research or pharmaceutical research. So I'm not plugging these companies, I just want to show you that if you think of some of the marvels of medicine and therapeutics and pharmacological uh, invention, that credit in the sense of our discussion has a great role to play in all that. So while capital accumulation could still be possible in the absence of credit, because it can, after all, even at the most primitive level of society, the gatherers, those primitive tribes which uh, gathered their food, foraging in forests and elsewhere for food, uh, they had no credit, but there was capital accumulation because when they made a tool which could be as simple as a hook, fishing hook, or a net, or an arch and arrow, this was capital accumulation. There's no credit, but there was capital accumulation. That is possible, but this is all very, very limited 
in order to have uh, <coughs> progress in the economy, you have to have credit. Credit is the bridge which could make the crossing of an important river possible without the very elaborate ways through fords and other means. So credit shrinks the time uh, between uh, planning for improvements and the actual realization of these plans. Uh, credit is a great thing. The problem with credit is that it's open to abuse and it's easy to abuse it. And that's what has been happening throughout history to greater or smaller extent. And what we have today, I think, is the worst possible case of abuse of credit throughout history. There's always abuse of credit. Credit is one of those two double-edged swords which could hurt you as well as help you. <coughs> <coughs> So credit abuse is one of the most difficult problems in economics. And exactly the same factors that make credit a great creative force and an engine of human progress will, when abused, render it a most dangerous agent of destruction very similar to atomic power, which could be a great benefit to society, but it could also be the greatest known destructive force. And so only at the margin it could just be a slight overreaching the threshold and then it's destructive. Below that, if you can keep it that way, it is beneficial, but once it's past the threshold, it becomes very destructive. So with credit, just as with any sharp instruments, the more beneficial the use is, the more devastating are the abuses. Yet precisely because of the way credit operates on the time element in the means and ends chain of human action, that it can shrink the time between planning and realization, abuses obscure the causality nexus and corrupts the feedback mechanism. I want to explain this a little bit because this is uh, interesting. In most cases, there is cause and effect, and we learn how to turn it to our advantage, that nature operates that way. And as a rule, if you make a mistake, it will soon become obvious, and then you have a chance to correct the mistake and avoid the problems in the future. Now, with credit, this is much more complicated and much more difficult because it's in the nature of credit to shrink this time element. So as a result, if credit abuse is involved, it's possible to continue without changing for a longer time. And by the time you realize that a mistake has been made, it's going to be the, the causality nexus, the cause and effect relationship will be obscured. Now if if uh, crime and punishment follow one another almost instantaneously, 
then the feedback is also instantaneous and you can make corrections. But if there is a longer period of time between the two, then a lot of people, especially people who uh, are lazy to think, will miss the causal relation and they will never say that, okay, we suffer now because 50 years ago our predecessors made such and such a mistake. So that is why credit and the abuse of credit is so dangerous because uh, it could obscure the causality relationship. So self-correcting becomes more difficult. I also want to leave some time for discussion, so I'm going to... Okay. The two sources of credit. I have very little time, but after all, yesterday we had an opportunity to say something about this. One source is savings and the other source is clearing. There's little difficulty with saving. Most people will agree that uh, if you save, which means you hold back consumption and carry on production, the excess of your produce could be put to some good use. And that's a very important source of credit. Much more controversial is the other source, clearing. And that's our major topic in this course throughout this week. So we'll have a lot of opportunity to talk about that. Because what is happening is that Modern production is a drawn-out process. Just imagine that in order to create a computer or a car or airplane, just what a long and drawn-out procedure it is if you really analyze that each ingredient which goes into the final product had an origin and it had to go through the various uh, states of development. So it's a, a, a very, very complicated process. But the financing of this production, whether, as I say, it's a computer or an airplane or what have you, is involving this second source, clearing. Because whatever ingredient you t take, which goes into an airplane or a computer, that ingredient has a very narrow market. It's good for that particular purpose. Indispensable, very important. But if you try to find another use for it, you'll be lost because in some cases you may, but in most cases you won't. That was produced for that purpose and no other. And for that reason, the financing of the production of that particular ingredient is very different from financing production for something for the market, where there are lots of consumers and they are competing for the product. So whereas production for the market is financed through the first source, production for the second is financed through another. Financed through saving, financed through clearing. That's one way of looking at it. The other way is the distinction between short-term credit and long-term credit. And uh, yesterday we talked about it. There is uh, 
dividing line, 91 days, if it's shorter, uh, then we talk about short-term credit or clearing, and if it's longer, long-term credit, and financing it involves saving. Now, this may look arbitrary. Yesterday, I uh, went out of my way to say a little bit more about it, and today I just uh, refer to that, what I said yesterday. It's not all that arbitrary, because 91 days is the length of the seasons of the year, and demand, as a rule, does change with the seasons of the year. So if you cannot sell a certain consumer good in 91 days, in most cases it means that you cannot sell it for a whole year until the same season of the year comes back. And in the meantime, that product could become obsolete, old-fashioned, or out of style, and therefore it can only be sold at a loss. So anything which you produce and can sell within 91 days has a completely different liquidity or marketing conditions, and, and that is quite important. Whereas there are other goods who, for which the demand is more even, but they usually not very liquid and uh, they serve some very special purpose. But there is this division, short term and long term. Now, in, uh, later in the course, we'll uh, have opportunity to talk at length about, uh, oh, and uh, I'm just repeating what I said yesterday, that using clearing involves no lending and no borrowing. This is perhaps one of the most difficult things to understand. Um, uh, during this course, so I'm going to keep coming back to it. That, that two sources of credit, they are both credit, no question, they have this in common, they are credit, saving, clearing. But, whereas using saving involves lending and borrowing, Clearing does not. And you may disagree with me at this moment, but I'm hoping by the end you finish this course on Friday, you will at least come or be inclined to agree with me that that is indeed the case. There is no lending and borrowing. But that's the difficulty which you face if you want to discuss uh, these questions with other economists who have a different background, even even uh, the followers of Ludwig von Mises, I'm sorry to say. Uh, I haven't <laughs> made much progress in convincing them. But uh, I think I have a solid case and I don't think that I'm in a minority of one on that because there are others, but we are still in the minority if it's not a minority of one. Something else follows from this also because the measure of credit from the first source saving is the rate of interest. The measure of credit from the other source clearing is the discount rate. And these two measures just don't mix. They are entirely different. As the word savings suggests, the motivation is the propensity to save. But it's just the opposite for the this country. In other words, the rate of interest is varying inversely with the propensity to save. 
the greater the propensity to save the lower the rate of interest and vice versa. But when it comes to the discount rate, it's no longer saving, it's consuming. So the discount rate is inversely related with the propensity to consume. We'll have more uh, we'll have other opportunities to discuss this in more details. I just mentioned that the dichotomy of the uh, of uh, saving and clearing carries on to the dichotomy of interest rate and discount rate. Now, I think I am going to invite your question and whatever else I will have to say, we'll, we'll say it in the afternoon. Any question you may want to ask? I have one, uh, but maybe it's a little bit too soon for it. Uh, it struck me that uh, what you were saying just now, there's a parallel between that and uh, what we were talking about last summer, where you said the, the interest rate is regulated by the savers on the, on the lower bound of the interest rate is regulated by the savers, the upper bound is regulated by the capitalists determining whether or not to invest. Yes. I was wondering if there's a parallel that you're going to talk about here where the Consumed is regulated on the downside by the consumers and on the, but on the upper bound by maybe the consumer product producers, uh, something like that. But I think that's a picture. I'm not, I'm not the picture. I'm not the diagram. That's what I think it's a little premature. I'll wait and hear what you uh, say. Yeah, uh, okay. I, I don't need an interpreter yeah. to answer that one. I'm very glad you asked this question. And, uh, I am not uh, suggesting that what I have to say is the last word on that. Uh, a question occurred to me several times during several years, other lectures, other discussions, and my present thinking suggests that there is a difference. When it comes to the rate of interest, they come in pairs. The upper limit and the lower limit. And the, and the lower limit is the, the one which has to do with saving the other. Because there are these two approaches. Well, you see, most of the people who here uh, didn't have the opportunity like you did to follow this other discussion. But the point is that interest rates are, have a, a double feature. There are two theories. The theory of time preference and the theory of productivity. And they were antagonistic theories. It's either or. Either you accept this, but then you reject the other, vice versa. And I think I have found a way to show that there's a synthesis. And that's through the ingenious idea of Menger of ask price, bid price. And there is a gap between the two. Now, what about the discount rate? Is it also true that there is a gap there? And I'm suggesting it to you that there is no gap. Because if you have a real bill, a real bill, remember yesterday we discussed the real bill can be used as money for certain purposes for a short period of time. During clearing, you don't pay gold from one producer to the next. You accept this clearing instrument.
The fact is that there's a bill market. There's a market where you can sell this bill, or using the technical word, discounted, because the, you don't sell at the nominal value, of, but you discount it by the number of days to maturity. And if you ask the question, in this bill market, is there an ask price and a bid price, and is there a gap between the two? The answer is that if there is, it's just too small, so for practical purposes, you do not calculate the discount when it's so small. So for practical purposes, a bill, whether you buy it or sell it, has the same value. Another way of putting it, you can, you can sell it back to back. If you have a bond, in comparison, you buy it and turn around and try to sell it, you won't get the price what you paid for it. You'll be happy to get something close to it, but less. There's a loss symbol. The same is not true for bills. You buy this bill now and change your mind some reason, turn it around and you can sell it practically the same price. So anyone making a market in bills then uh, 100 years ago was only, they were making the thinnest of margins. Sin sinister of margin. Sinister of margin. So, you know, for professional bill traders, it might have made a difference. But for ordinary people, if you buy or sell, no loss involved. And, and uh, that's my best answer. Well, yeah, that's all, I, it helps me tremendously because I'm trying to envision what the world looked like yeah. years ago. It sounds like bills, the only time they ever paid a chance was when either an individual who wanted to put some short term money away, they would just buy it and hold it to maturity. And they never sold a game. So most bills never, aside from the reinforcement of the actual process, most bills never traded hands for the months if they left the production process. That proves the. And this, this is a bad word, I don't even know if it's in the dictionary. Moneyness, moneyness, the quality of being money or close to money. The bill can serve as money. But long term debt, bonds, doesn't matter how many governments put their stamp on it and vouch that this is full faith and credit, makes no difference. It won't make it money. Why? Because there is a bid price and there is an ask price. And if you try to sell it back to back, you will take a loss. But a bill is different. A bill can be sold back to back without a loss. It's liquid. It's very highly liquid, just like money. And that's why Adam Smith's real bills doctrine is valid and it works and could be made to work again. That's why bankers didn't make a living back then. No, <laughs> that's right. They had the toughest competition. The toughest competition. Bankers make money in the making of markets. And we've come to the conclusion that the making of markets and the maintenance of markets is a critical factor in the health of our economy. But that's because of the distortion that the bankers have brought to the economy itself. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much. I'll see you this afternoon, right? For 2.30. Two